we were able to give the project more stability in terms of increased staff and the launch of two training programs for almost 40 operators. So due to the worldwide situation, we had to postpone the completion of the training of some operators and unfortunately the kickoff of some inmate programs. Uh, nevertheless, we didn't give up and kept going. So we took advantage of this forced stop to further refine the training programs, which include educational activities for new operators and new supervision procedures. And we stand up a task force of fearless, amazing operators that guarantee the constant presence in the detention centers whenever possible. Of course, taking all the necessary precautions due to the situation. Then we have maintained contacts with the inmates either by email or by letter and maintain contacts with former inmates by email or telephone. Then we have extended the phone counseling to family members because uh, the ban on visits further exasperate existing difficulties. You can, of course, understand. Uh, we have produced and distributed meditation CDs to support the practice as well as DVDs with uh, the teachings of the masters who have visited the prison in the past. And then, of course, we have provided Dharma books. Uh, so one year ago, uh, you probably remember, Robina, we all met in Pomaya. We had a great big party. Mm -hmm. And on that occasion, we pledged to meet every year at the end of January. So here we are. And uh, this year, given the overall situation, uh, we are even more committed to fulfill that promise. And we have decided to further open our family house doors, making the teachings normally reserved to Liberation Prison Project operators available to all of you, hoping that you could be benefited. Uh, this is why we're happy to make such teachings available not only in English, but also, of course, in Italian, in Spanish, in French, and in Russian. For us operators and people engaged in this project, not a day goes by without there being, in our thoughts, a profound gratitude for this opportunity to allow, that allowed us to walk the path alongside different people, be they inmates, wardens, victims, or free citizens. We share a profound belief in sharing the effort of mindfully transforming a moment of setback in an opportunity for personal development. Last November, during an operator refresh course, uh, the need to investigate further the notion of judgment was felt. Uh, so our preachers Robina agreed to speak to us on this topic today. So we thank once more Venerable Robina for the teachings and the advice that she shared with us. And as they are the valid tools, not only for our daily work, but also for daily life. Uh, so I really would like to take the opportunity to ask Robina to speak about her new book, Enjoy Life Liberated from the Inner Prison. Um, so at the end of the teachings, there will be time for questions. I don't know if there will be, but I hope so. Oh, we must have uh, questions. Yes, no question. There will be questions. Okay. Our operators who have just completed one further step in, in their training program today have already prepared some, but anyone can ask questions. Uh, uh, just write them in the chat uh, in English or in your mother tongue or mother language. Uh, and uh, we will manage, our team will manage to translate them into English and then uh, give them to Robina. Mm -hmm. So, Good. thank you, Robina. Good listening and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.
So just to think, just to start our time together with a little motivation, thinking we're here together to think about, analyse, contemplate, internalise these words that we will be using, you know, coming from the Buddha's view of the universe, the Buddha's view of the mind. That's what we'll be discussing. So if there's even 1% of what we all discuss that you find useful, then that's fantastic. Put it into practice. Because every word we are going to say has to be practical, doesn't it? So that's our wish. And that we can become better human beings so that we can become better helpers of other human beings. So first of all, Lara mentioned the new book of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's. Um, Rinpoche, we use his title. Rinpoche loves his own titles, but usually by the time it gets to the publisher, the publishers are very conservative, so they don't like his crazy titles. But this title is, he wanted this, what, what this book is, a couple of years ago, he very kindly asked me to compile all his letters that he'd written the last 20 years since Liberation Prison Project started. Well, actually more than 20. We started in, in America when I got a letter. I'll tell you, I'll start this. When I got a letter from this young Mexican-American fellow called Arturo. So he told me he was in prison, in prison since, a gang, in gangs since he was 11 in Los Angeles, Mexican, in prison since he was 12, and now he was about 18 or 20 when he wrote to us, and this was in 1996 when I was editing Mandela, the, you know, the English um, magazine of the FPMT, Lama Zopa's organization. So Lama Zopa, anyway, this has started in 96. So two years ago, Lama Zopa asked me to compile all these letters, more than 100, easily more than 100, to all these prisoners who had first written to Rinpoche himself and then he responded, you know, so to put them into a book. So that the only way to manage it, I thought, was to make it, turn it, not to do it like letters, but to do it into a coherent narrative. Then basically fault tracking in a very kind of easygoing way, tracking you know, the first part is all back, background, all related to the different approaches in Buddhism, like karma and compassion and emptiness. And then the second part is, the first part is how to think, and the second part is what to do, how to put all this into practice, you know. So everything in the letters was there. Every bit of the Buddhist path to enlightenment was included, of course. So it, Rinpoche wanted to call it how to enjoy, what is it? What's the, what's the title again? What? What was it, Lara? I forget. How to enjoy the, how to enjoy life. Joy, life liberated. Oh, from how the to enjoy prison. life liberated from the inner prison so that the outer prison mm -hmm. doesn't become the real prison. That's Lama Zopa's title and subtitle. And it's totally appropriate, of course, you know. So that's. That came. We we decided we would do it as a fundraiser for Liberation Prison Project. I think mainly not much money is coming from it, but everybody can use it. But initially, the funding we maybe now five or six thousand dollars has coming in for the for the American for for um, Liberation Prison Project in America and Australia. They have no funding, so that's come. It's going to them, and so we're selling it through. So if you, I'll send a Lara can send you the link, can't you? To the, to the book, to the website for the book where you can order it and you make it, you order it and you can make a donation. So hopefully, of course, the different, la the different um, countries will translate it into, and it's already that's being organized. It was published by Liber uh, Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive, but then it was funded by Bodhicitta Trust, which is a, a trust that I have. We funded the, pr the production of it and we're organizing the, the distribution and the selling of it. And then all the, all the profit will go to the prison project in America. That's the background. So anyway, um, yeah, so how the prison project started, as I said, was this letter. I was editing Mandela, and this letter turned up, came on my desk, you know. So it came, and this is the interesting point for me, the starting point of it, was it came to my desk. I was the editor, and this man wrote, this young man wrote to, the, to Mandela. He'd seen our address in a book of Lama Yeshi's. He'd read one of Lama Yeshi's books, and he told me that it was in this, you know, top security prison where he's in his cell 23 hours a day, which is really common, million, I mean, th okay, never mind. So anyway, blah, blah, it started and then it just grew. I mean, the way we were in the way, the way you people in Italy are doing it is really different and it's wonderful what you're doing. In America, it was more because there's so many prisons and the country is so vast and millions, I mean, the biggest number of prisoners in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in actual terms, the biggest number of prisoners 
in actual terms as well as relative terms are in the United States. It seems like, you know, I mean, there are three, I mean, I forget many, how many million in, in prisons in America, but even re relatively speaking, the United States is said to have 5% of the world population, but it's got 25% of the prison population. So in the entire planet, all people who live in prison, a quarter of them live in United States prisons. And it's increasing. I mean, this is outrageous, beyond unbelievable, you know. So the way we began in America was um, writing letters. People would write to us. We then have a team of people, and that's you know, and, and that it grew, you know. So sometimes we were getting 1,000 letters a month. We would also visit in prisons, but not nearly, not nearly as much of that. That's why the Italian program is so marvellous, you know. So the main way we support, and still it's the same, Tupton Cherokee, an Australian nun, took over from me in 2009, and she still runs it, I think, in Australia and America. And then there are other, as you know, other groups in other countries. So anyway, judgment. Let's look at this. So that's not, I think you, you probably won't find that word in Tibetan. I'm not sure. So what does it mean? Let's unpack this word. And of course, I'm going to be using the Buddhist psychological model because that's my job, to talk Buddhism, you know? So let's use the Buddhist approach to the mind to really break down what we mean by that word, because there's many parts of our mind involved in what we mean by judgment, you know? So it's very clear in the Buddhist view. You know, um, when we study the Buddhist psychological model, we will discover that when Buddha talks about the, the mental consciousness, he describes, he divides into three categories all the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of thoughts and feelings and emotions, which seems to us like a big soup. We don't see, we don't have much clarity about the contents of our mind at all. And that's not really the way we think in modern psychology, you know, or in neuroscience, maybe. But the Buddhist model is very amazing. It's based on these incredible Indians before the Buddha, well before the Buddha. I always quote this. The Dalai Lama, His Holiness, said one time, it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. And then Buddha diverged in his own direction, specifically in relation to his own direct experiential findings about the nature of self and indeed the nature of the universe. So the mind actually is the expertise of the Buddha. There's no question about that. We might not think that in the West, you know, but it's in it and the precision and clarity that Buddhist ha Buddhism has about the mind is really quite a surprise to us when we study it. It's a very different approach than the way we think in the modern world. So, OK. These three categories, what are they? On the face of it, they sound very almost simplistic, you know. We don't talk in these terms in modern psychology or in neuroscience. The, the mental consciousness, as far as the Buddha is concerned, well, first of all, we have sensory consciousness, and there's a very clear way in Buddhism. And this plays a role in our lives every day. This plays, you know, there's a, a very clear way that our sensory consciousness functions. The, in other words, the eye consciousness co perceives certain things. Ear consciousness perceives certain things etc. And actually, as Lama Yeshi says, we make the body the boss. We give far more power to our sensory consciousness. And this is when we begin to go into this in more detail, I think not today, but when we understand this, it's very humbling because we'll realize we're misrepresenting things to ourselves all the time based upon our sensory experiences, which really is really misleading. So there's the sensory consciousness, but then the real work is in the mental consciousness. That's where the workshop is, as Lama Zopa Rinpoche puts it. And that's the Buddha's expertise, the description of the contents of what goes on in this crazy mind of ours from the first second we wake up until the second we go to sleep, you know. So the Buddha divides it, Buddha divides it very clearly into these three categories. Like I said, it seems almost simplistic. The first category would be all the neurotic, deluded, unhappy, disturbing, distressing, ridiculous states of mind. And we know them well, we're intimately familiar. Anger, attachment, low self-esteem, depression, rage, anxiety, panic, Arrogance. I mean, these are simple words we are intimately familiar with. So then, then we have, and, and these are all rooted, there's a very dis clear description in Buddhist psychology, these are all rooted in this root, you know, this root primordial 
biggest mistake, biggest unhappy emotion of all, that's so primordially deep, we don't even have an equivalent for it in modern psychology. And this in Buddhism known, is known colloquially as ego grasping. We won't be going too much into this today, but just giving you the picture. This is the deepest, most primordial mistake in the mind that clings to and believes in a, a kind of a, in, in a wrong sense of self. Everything stems from that. So the main voice in day-to-day -day life that comes from that deep ego grasping, it's known as attachment. And then on the basis of attachment, you have then what is called aversion. So these three simple words, the, the correct term for this ego grasping, which is one of the sin, kind of a colloquial terms, is simply called ignorance. In Tibetan, mahrigpa. And it's a primordial ignorance about the nature of ourself. So then on the basis of that, you have attachment. On the basis of that, you have aversion. So these are the, called the three poisons. We all read about this in Buddhist books. From the first book you read, you're going to read about the three poisons. It sounds so cute. So you don't go to your therapist. Oh, I've got the three poisons. She will laugh at you. It sounds so silly because it's not how we talk in our world. But to understand these three properly... This is the basis of being a Buddhist. If we don't understand these, and then also the, uh, all the other thousands of unhappy states of mind that are rooted in these three, we simply don't understand Buddhist psychology, therefore we don't understand Buddhist practice, therefore we can't achieve the goal that Buddha says we can achieve, which is to lessen the neuroses and grow the, the next category of state of mind, the next category are called the virtuous or positive or useful or productive states of mind. And we all know these as well. Love, kindness, generosity, intelligence, you know, all these good qualities. So we are so familiar with these words, anger, attachment, jealousy, love, compassion, kindness. We all know them. But we don't think like this in daily life. We sort of, it seems a bit simple for us. We're so familiar with the materialist models of the mind, with neuroscience, I'm not criticizing. This is our world. We use these complicated terms like personality disorder, OCD, ADHD, bipolar, schizophrenia, many, many hundreds of different terms used in the, in the psychiatric, you know, textbooks. Buddhism has a way of presenting every single one of these. Don't think there's not, you know. But it seems too simple for us, so we don't really get it. So I'm just giving you a bit of background. So the third category, I'm not going to go into this. Well, I know it, it's interesting, this third lot. They call them neutral. They call negative, positive, and neutral. And these aren't terms we're comfortable with psychologically because they sound judgmental to us. We don't like to say negative. We don't like to say positive. And indeed, that sounds definitely judgmental. So, so we've got to understand what Buddhism means by this very precisely. So this third category, if you call it, if you say neutral, we think that means not important, but absolutely that is not the meaning. So these are, I like to call these the mechanics of the mind. So what are they? Well, good memory, concentration, intention, attention, discrimination. There's many of these that are crucial in order to function day to day. But the point of these is a murderer and a meditator both need good concentration. They both need discrimination. They both need good memory. And good memory is the real meaning of the word mindfulness. So if we don't understand the Buddha's approach to these words, we really don't understand Buddhism, you know. So there are those deluded, ridiculous, disturbing, neurotic, distressing, deeply unhappy states of mind that have two functions. One is to make us deeply disturbed and suffer, but two, and this is the crucial piece, and this is going to help us when we start looking at judgment, is that they, are, they cause us to not see the person properly. It causes us not to see what's in front of us properly. And the term in English that's an excellent word, that's really accurate in English, and I think it exists in Spanish and French and maybe Italian, the meaning, maybe you don't use it in those languages, but in English it's a perfect word. The word is delusion. So if you, in English, if you are delusional, you're not in touch with reality. And this is exactly what Buddha says. So for example, if I'm attached to chocolate cake, 
the simple function of attachment, it's multifaceted, but the essential function of the attachment, and we'll go into this, is that it exaggerates the deliciousness of the chocolate cake. It exaggerates the role of the chocolate cake to make me happy. So literally, it's a lie. It's literally a lie in the mind. Then it causes me then to grasp at the chocolate cake and to manipulate to get it, etc., etc. Now, cake doesn't mind, but when it's a person, you try to manipulate. It's a person, you're in love with your boyfriend. Attachment in you exaggerates the deliciousness of the boyfriend. So it causes you to be really not living in reality. This is quite literally what Buddhist psychology says. So initially, it's hard to see this function, but this is the crucial one. So that's the first lot. And so Buddha's amazing discovery from his own direct experience is that all these neurotic, deluded, distressing, disturbing, nonsense states of mind are not at the core of our being. This is fundamental. This is the basis of the fact that you can become a Buddha. Bud means, the etymology of the syllable Buddha is that we can rid the mind of all this nonsense. This is very radical psychologically. This is not how neuroscience talks. This is not how modern psychology talks. This is very clear. We must understand this if we want to understand Buddhism. Then the next point, Buddha, da, implies the development to perfection of all the other parts of our mind. The goodness, the kindness, the love, the virtue, the clarity, the intelligence. And these are, for the Buddha, at the core of our being. These are what define us. And these can be literally perfected. This is the essence of what Buddhas, the whole Buddhist path is telling us. So if that's true, we'd better learn to know our mind. And that's where the third category comes in. That's what in when you start to learn single-pointed concentration, shamatha, mindfulness, as the world vaguely calls it. This is where these different states of mind come into play. You've got to develop concentration. You've got to develop good mindfulness. Now, mindfulness in the West has many other connotations. People have put extra bells and whistles onto this. But the key meaning here is it's neither a virtuous state of mind nor non-virtuous but it's crucial if you don't remember basically it means not forgetting what you're doing moment by moment by moment so if you're making a cake and you forget what you're doing then you're hopeless if you're trying to drive a car and you forget what you're doing moment by moment you're hopeless if you're trying to kill somebody and you're pointing the gun but you forget what you're doing you'll be you'll be a bad murderer so this is, as Lama Zopa says, thieves need mindfulness. So that's really crucial to understand this, ca this category in Buddhist psychology. It's not virtuous, these characteristics, which are crucial to function day to day. Many of them are working every single second, and they're completely working in the background. We don't even notice. But as we become familiar with our minds, we can develop these parts of ourselves. And these are developed to a brilliant degree in shamatha meditation. So the, this is the Buddhist approach. And this is not how we talk, as I said, in modern psychology. So now this is getting into judgment now. So now, when we say judgment, on one hand, you need... Judgment is another word in Buddhism. It's in the third category. It's called discrimination. It's called discernment. If I'm trying to discover what is the colour there, I have to distinguish between yellow and blue. That's discernment. That's good judgment. If I'm trying to drive the car, I have to assess how far away from the car in front of me I need to be if I have to put my foot on the brake quickly and not to crash. That's called good judgment. We need good judgment. This is clear. So it, it, in a sense, you could argue one aspect of judgment is, is simply a neither virtuous non, or nor, nor non-virtuous, but it's necessary. It's intelligence. Now, let's look at it the way we mean it when in a negative sense. Well, what's that called? Well, it's very simple. It's called anger. It's very easy. It's called aversion. But we've got to understand this word. So let's go right back to the three poisons, these three toxic emotions that Buddhism describes. You know, these three. In fact, Buddha talks about thousands of neurotic states of mind, but they all subsume to these three. There's a very precise map in Buddhism, which is a big surprise to us. And this map, where did it come from? It's not a map of the brain. It's a map of the internal, actual, 
cognitive process itself. This is what's so remarkable about these Indians before the Buddha and indeed about the Buddha. It's quite incredible. You discover it internally on the basis of getting single-pointed concentration, this brilliant technique these Indians invented, you know? So judgment in a negative way is meaning you see somebody and you, 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 and this, you, know, you, you find fault. Very simple, you find fault. But even that is not a problem. Let's analyze this. And this is the miracle of the clarity that we need to discover. I remember Martin Luther King, when I was an old radical lefty po political activist back in the 70s, you know, before I became a Buddhist. I always remember Martin Luther King said, it's good to find fault. It's good to say, oh my God, look at the racism, look at the sexism, look at those bad actions. I'm using his word, I'm exaggerating, I'm, I'm adding to his words. So we need, that's called, that's not called judgment. That's a fact. If you see some man kick a dog, you're not, you know, if you're hallucinating and he's not kicking a dog, then you're in trouble. But the fact is, he is kicking a dog. So Martin Luther King said, it is good to see the fault. It is good to say there is racism, there is sexism, there is poverty, there is injustice. Now that's a fact, but to even get to see a fact is not that easy. Because why? Because our mind is driven by one of the three poisons. So if I've got lots of attachment to dogs, and I, okay, this is the difference between attachment and love. Love is in the second category. Love is a virtue. Love is a good quality. Love is reasonable. Love is not delusional. Love is a delight in someone else's happiness. So if I love my dog, in the Buddhist use of the word, I see my dog, I see my doggy is happy, I am happy for my dog. That's called love. I see my friend happy, I'm happy for my friend. May you be happy. That's the meaning of love, and it's in the, it's in the virtuous category. Now, that we don't notice, but it's completely polluted by the another state of mind in the first category, which are the neurotic ones, the deluded ones, the nonsense ones, the, emo the negative emotions, the disturbing emotions, the afflictions, as we see in Buddhist psychology, and that's called attachment. This is driving, the Buddha says, if you, in the Four Noble Truths, Buddha says, if you, you know, the main cause of our suffering day to day is attachment. The, and, this we, and this, we can understand attachment and then aversion, these two have an intimate relationship. They're not just, come va they're not just some vague idea. Buddha is so precise in his analysis of these states of mind. So attachment drives us. That then gives so then when it, and then and I'll describe okay I'll describe briefly because that if we don't understand attachment we cannot understand aversion and if we don't understand aversion we cannot understand judgment in the way we're describing here so let's let's look at attachment this is the driving force and it's primordially deep in us I mean Buddha's analysis of attachment is way more profound than we would tend to think Lama Yeshi said I could tell you about attachment for one whole year. You'll never begin to understand it until you start to build up something in your own mind, you know, from practice. So attachment is multifaceted. It's this primordial, it's this primordial emo, uh, dissatisfaction. We come born with it. Then that gives rise to emotional hunger. Because if you feel dissatisfied, you, you're hungry for something. So then where do you look to, for, to satisfy your emotional hunger? The outside world, the objects of the five senses, the tastes, the smells, the shape of the boyfriend, the music. I mean, look at us. This is normal world. Everybody's run like this. So this is the first level of our attachment. It, it jumps onto the objects of the world. Then the next job of attachment, this emotional hunger, then... Exa as I said, exaggerates the deliciousness of the boyfriend, of the cake, of whatever it might be. And then you manipulate and control to get it. And then you possess it. All of this, it's multifaceted. This is running instinctively in our minds every single second. Now, fortunately, we also have some of the next category of states of mind, love and kindness and patience and generosity these are our saving grace if we mainly have attachment you're going to be one of the psychopaths you'll be a monster you'll just have this immense self-centered frantic hunger to get what you want 
every single second. That's the job of attachment. So fortunately, our attachment is tempered, is lessened, is mitigated by love, forgiveness, kindness, patience, generosity, the virtuous qualities. And the job of being a Buddhist, I tell you, from here to Buddhahood, this is the key job of a Buddhist, to learn to distinguish between these two categories of states of mind. That's it. I mean, it almost seems too simple, but this is the job in Buddhism. When we know this and learn this, this is what brings the sanity. This is what brings our own happiness. This is what brings our spiritual development. And this is what brings us our ability to help others, you know. So attachment is the drive, the hunger to get what I want. And it's so implicit, it's so instinctive that we actually don't notice it much of the time, you know. So now, now let's look at what happens when this emotional hunger, which is basically a junkie to get what I want every millisecond. Now let's look at what happens, what arises in my mind the second attachment doesn't get what it wants. That's the arising of this third poison, at anger. A aversion is the best word. Aversion is the, is the simple state of mind. That's the exact opposite of the state of mind of attachment. So attachment is like, you know, the energy of attachment it's, it's see something as delicious and you go towards it. The energy of aversion is the exact opposite. You, it, is, it is not, when it, when, it, it, when, it, when it goes onto that cake, when, it, when attachment is expecting chocolate cake and instead carrot cake appears in front of you, what arises that second is aversion. No, that's not what I want. And how will the cake appear? It will appear ugly. It will appear not delicious. It will be not what you want. We run between this attachment and this aversion a thousand times a day and at the deepest, most primordial levels. So of course we've got to start at the grossest level and catch our mind you know, before the words vomit out the mouth. I did not order a carrot cake, etc. This is so, sub so, sub so subtle, you know. On the face of it, the words sound kind of cute. Attachment, aversion, God, who cares, you know. That's primordial. So aversion, it too is multifaceted. So it's got a whole range of expressions. So the obvious, most volatile level of aversion is called anger. You can see people shouting and yelling, I did not order carrot cake. Take this cake away. That's called anger. We'll get that. But lots of you right now in front of me do not express yourself like that. But you still have aversion, but you don't express it with your mouth. So we would say, oh, she's not angry. But you start to look at your mind and you're going to see that in your mind you're thinking, how dare you give me carrot cake? But you, you don't even notice it. And if someone says, are you happy with carrot cake, Rabina? Oh, it's okay, but you're lying to yourself. Aversion is in your mind. You're pretending. You're not noticing your own anger. Aversion, so there's the grosser level of aversion is anger. Then the less volatile, and this is another aspect of it, and we all of us experience this every second of the day. The second your attachment doesn't get what it wants, you hear a noise that isn't quite comfortable, you get annoyed. You drop a cup while you're washing the, the dishes, you get upset. Your husband doesn't listen to you perfectly, you get frustrated. The things don't work the way you want, you get upset, irritated, annoyed, frustrated. These are mild levels of anger, but we think they are completely normal. We pay no attention to them, but they are anger. So the key function of attachment is to hungrily want something that you want, and then it exaggerates the deliciousness of it. The key function of aversion, which is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. It's thwarted attachment. That's what anger is. You would not have anger. You would not have aversion. You would not have frustration, irritation, upset if you didn't have attachment. Attachment is driving everything. It underpins everything. It is primordial. And this is a clear presentation from Buddhist psychological way of seeing the mind, you know. This is really profound if we can understand it. So, so, 
aversion is when you over exaggerate the ugliness of somebody it's very clear that's what judgment is in this negative way you hear about a person who killed somebody and because especially if they killed your beloved pussycat oh my god the aversion the rage the anger that you would have for that person would cause them to look like hitler in your mind you would have incredible anger and that and that person would appear like a monster to you it is so now if it's i'm looking at the same person and it's not my pussycat i will be i'll be a bit upset but i won't have the same rage because every second if we see and hear and get what our attachment wants that person that music that object will appear delicious and so we will go towards it and think it's lovely so attachment paints a lovely picture of something aversion which is when attachment doesn't get what it wants paints an ugly picture of somebody or something so this is how we live our lives so we're not seeing reality now you know this is true when someone say doesn't like you you know we all got people who don't like us we're so shocked we can't believe it what did we do wrong we know that their picture of us literally is an inaccurate picture it is not an accurate picture we so putting it in buddhist terms their aversion and it could be fairly mild i mean they don't want to kill you but they have a version in their mind because you for whatever reason don't suit their attachment you're not saying the words they want to hear you don't you don't look like the person their attachment wants you're not doing what their attachment wants so they paint a picture of you as ugly to whatever degree we do this with the entire universe every second of the day this is what buddha means by being in samsara so judgment if i'm in prison and i visit prisoners and i hear about a person who's been a you know a pedophile well first of all when i went into prisons when well, i first started writing to prisoners when we first started the prison project it was very clear to me that you know because i knew a little bit about buddhism having worked on my own mind for a while i kind of you know understood that they're in exactly the same boat as me they've got attachment they've got aversion they want to be happy they don't want to suffer and because i have a, a real liking for the buddha's teachings about karma so when i understood the law of karma and applied it to my friends in prison you know then i you know i can understand due to karma because of this there were that that's why they're prison therefore this therefore that so i we never asked them what they did i was not interested unless they told us you know so the thing that because for us so this is the thing for us when we started the only prisoners we would meet would be the prisoners who wrote to us so obviously the only prisoner to write to us wouldn't be the psychopath would be the person who wants buddhism so straight away you you know the people who we didn't go into prison this is a major point actually many people asked me well when you went into prison what made them why did they want to listen to you they I, that wasn't the point the crucial point is this when we when a, a person would write to us well obviously no one forced them to write to us they heard about us they read a buddhist book they wrote to us so clearly what they wrote in there was their heart they expressed their heart arturo when he first wrote he did say what he'd done he'd been he didn't no he hadn't killed anybody but his sentence was very severe because in california the sentencing is very severe for the gangsters he was given three life sentences and he hadn't even killed anybody and he was tried as an adult even though he was still a juvenile he was not 16 so he showed this open heart he read lama yeshi he was moved by the teachings of compassion so every letter we received was obviously not a psychopath wanting to kill buddhists it was a person whose heart had been touched by hearing about buddhism by wanting to meditate by wanting to put their lives together or well, straight away what we could see when we read that letter we knew that person was in prison we knew they had a life sentence i knew that the guy called mitch who contacted us was on death row so clearly he'd done something naughty you know but what we saw in those letters and when i would go into the prisons the only people who would come to the talk would be those who would want to come to the talk they weren't forced to come so they were hearts were open to buddhism so that's the part of the person that we talked to we knew i knew the other part was there they must have killed somebody they must have raped somebody they must have been a pedophile whatever i mean in sydney i go to the unit where the where the sex offenders are you know and what i try to see I know those facts are there. I know they're there. But I try to see the person not through the lenses of anger, how dare they hurt children. That's what anger is. 
You know, how dare they kill people? That's what anger is. I saw, I recognise they'd done that. Because I have the view of karma, I know I've done it in countless past lives, so who am I to judge, as we would say? So I focused on their good part. So I didn't let my attachment take control. I didn't let my anger take control. I tried to put those to the side and responded to the better part of those people, which is the virtuous part of my mind, kindness and intelligence and discrimination and seeing if I could give advice that they could use to help them. So, you know, if you don't know, in other words, what I'm getting at is if I don't know my mind, if I can't distinguish between attachment and aversion, not to mention all the others, and then love and compassion, how can I help anybody? I'm completely confused, you know. And in the end, you know, this is what I found very common. Many people were very moved by this work. So in America, we would have people volunteer, not so much to go into prisons, but to write to prisoners. So in the beginning, we had a, people would volunteer, so moved by the idea of helping a prisoner. But after six weeks, they'd give it up because they were mainly driven by attachment, some, some pity, you know, oh, poor prisoners, wow, wow. But then, then, it was, then they gave up. So if you're driven by attachment, it won't last. If you're driven by anger, it won't last. But if you're driven by the wish to help human beings, which is not easy, then it will last, you know. So the key point that I'm describing here is this ability first to work on my mind. And if you say you're Buddhist, you don't have to be a Buddhist. No one says you should. No one says that. But if you choose it, you need to study Buddhist model of the mind. Otherwise, it's just, you know, I like Buddha. It's very nice to like Buddha. But if you don't know what Buddha's, if you don't know what Buddha's instructions are, you're in trouble, you know. And this is the basis of practice. This is lovely analogy. A bird needs two wings. Wisdom and compassion. Every word so far I have been mentioning is the work of the wisdom wing, which is the nuts and bolts of Buddha's teachings. One, about karma, and two, about the mind, how it functions. Then when you've got that as a tool in your toolkit, this is what you use to work on your mind to discriminate between attachment and love, anger and compassion. Then you can be useful. Then you can recognize these different parts. So, and but so this point I'm saying again, judgment. We think judgment means, oh, that person kicked the dog. Oh, you're judging. No, that's not judgment. That's intelligence. You saw them kick the dog. My friend on death row, Mitchell, who's going to be killed any minute, he said, I'm ready for that electric jolt. I've known him for 25 years. He, he did kill two people. That's a fact. That's the fact. But the, that's a fact. So facts, what we have to discriminate between is facts and fictions. So fictions are what attachment makes up, what anger makes up. They make up lies. They exaggerate. They distort but the facts are, yes, Mitchell killed two people in a gunfight with his friend, Leaf, who's also on death row, when they were on drugs with guns dealing with drugs. Facts, facts, facts. But is Mitch an evil person? That's not a fact. Is Mitch trying to practice? That's a fact. So you have to discriminate the bare bones fact, he did kill people, from let's look at Mitch's better half. Mitch wants to practice. Mitch is an amazing practitioner. He's ready for his death date, you know. So we've got to, just, and if you can't do this for your own mind, you cannot help a fly, not even forget about a human being, you know. So I think, Lara, now would be wonderful to now open up to questions because all the things will become clear in questions. That's my thought. Yes, dear Rubina, I'm in charge for questions. Uh, Good, Massimo. Yeah. You go. Oh, hello. hello there. Nice to see you again. Yes. yes. Thank you for, uh, for okay. your precious talks and for being here. Wonderful. Um, I have to say that many things you've said uh, that I answer already for the questions. We have uh, um, had a couple of hours with the operators in Good. Italy and uh, to discuss about judgment. Good. And uh, one thing that, uh, yes, you described very, very well is that the, the, the difference from uh, judgment and discernment so the, the negative sense of judgment yes that's right and the, the positive yeah and so exactly. we discuss a lot about that's that right. so how to 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 help people in prison to to have this kind of discernment about the two you kind mean, of positive you mean the prisoners themselves or the people who go yes into prison? we as operator in, in prison no how to to help uh, to create uh, a less judgment uh from their side so, well i'm not trying yes. to i'm not trying to sound simple massimo but like i said before if you haven't done that work yourself 
If you yeah. haven't learned to distinguish in your mind, based on Buddhist psychology, what attachment is, what anger is, what discernment is, what compassion is, if you haven't done that work, how can you possibly teach them? That's the answer. Yeah. That's, the, that's the actual answer. I'm not trying to be clever. That is, it's like you're asking me, how can, I, how can I teach prisoners how to play piano? Well, guess what, honey? You have to play piano first. It's almost, the answer is almost so simple, it's embarrassing. Then, yes. and that really is the answer. As Dalai Lama says, compassion is the point, how to help others. But compassion, I'm now paraphrasing, but compassion, you see, compassion, the two wings, compassion is the wish to help others. But compassion is not enough. What gives us the ability to help others is the wisdom wing, Massimo. And that's the work we do. Whether it's piano, killing people, which is not really compassion. But you have to have the skill, the clarity, the wisdom here first. And the wisdom we're describing here is the wisdom about how the mind works. And whose mind? Your mind. Then compassion can come easily. And then ability to help. That's the answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what about the, the, the serious crimes uh, already in prison? The strong identif identification with, um, with the deeds. This is bringing a, a, a very strong self-judgment. So, so, you so you're talking about a person themselves who has killed yes. somebody. Well, this is the point. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, okay, it's a good point. What I've found with the people who've shown interest in Buddhism, who've written to us, or if I give a talk in the prison and the prisoners come to the, come to the class, what we, we talk a lot, I mean, I talk a lot about karma, the background. Many people as Buddhists don't talk about karma very much. Many people mainly focus on mindfulness and meditation, but I find the, the, the view of the philosophy of karma very fascinating and very marvelous experientially for myself so it's up to individual helpers whether you want to talk about this but i found the number of prisoners who have really committed themselves to buddhism that the, the listening to the teachings about karma and how we create karma and how how come you did the killing and therefore how you can purify it they find it a revelation it's a revelation to, and then the fact that you've had countless past lives or even the fact that you know when I you go into detail about let's say I'll use my example of having an abortion like I wasn't put into prison because that's not against the law but you know as we know Buddhism would suggest that that's a consciousness that came to my womb at the time of conception when I was 23 living in London I was a hippie and I decided to have an abortion so it's a simple example an, an example of killing even though it's not the same as killing your mother or killing the next door neighbor, it's still a person, okay? So there's a come, I'll describe this, and the prisoners who like Buddhism really found it very powerful because often, because what, okay, what I'm getting at is this. The Buddhist approach, even with, for women having abortions, we have so much guilt, and that's what I'm talking about for people in prison. You don't know why you did something. Suddenly you're in a bar, and before you know it, someone's dead, and you, you're more shocked than anybody because you're not a psychopath. You don't have a wish to kill people. Suddenly, out of the blue, you kill somebody. This is what destroys people sometimes because you think, why did I do this? Why did this happen? You can't see any logic to it. So all I know is I'm telling the Buddhist view Then the, the, the same with abortion, you know. So then the karma is, there's a consciousness that came to my womb. I was lying in bed. I don't want to give too much detail. It doesn't matter. But I was lying in bed with a boy. And this consciousness who had a very strong karmic history with me, it's a karmic connection. You can't kill a person you haven't met before. You can't love a person you haven't met before. So, for example, the karma between me and this consciousness, it ran like a magnet to my womb. And then due to the karma between us, which means that person, that being who came to my womb had must have, you know, must have um, killed me in the past. This is the view of karma. So then this is interdependent scenario between me and this fetus. So the first moment I heard I was pregnant, I decided I'm going to have an abortion. I didn't think I want to kill. I didn't think like that. But there's a karmic connection. So this is very powerful with a person. I mean, you know, so many examples. Okay, if, if you're a crazy person who wants to kill all the time, that's different. But even, no, not different. That is explained by the fact that you come into this life with a strong tendency to kill. You know your mother didn't teach you. You know the nuns at school didn't teach you. So you wonder, why do I want to kill? Why do I think about killing all the time? A friend of mine on death row in Kentucky with Mitch, the Buddhist, he said, Mitch told me, Rubina, he thinks, this guy, another guy, he thinks of torture 
all the time. So he doesn't know why he wants to torture. His mother didn't teach him. But when you hear the teachings about karma, you come into this life due to that habit. Why do you want to be loving all the time? Why do you want to play music all the time? Why do you want to eat food all the time? Same logic. So the view of karma, I've found, is such a powerful way to explain the why it happened. So you, there you are at a bar, not thinking of killing anybody, and before you know it, you've killed somebody. You know, you're totally surprised. And then you, so when you understand the law of karma, that it's an interdependent scenario, it loosens the grip of this guilt, like it's all my fault. No, it's not. You know, so it's the same with an abortion, same with everything that happens, goodness and badness. So I don't know, it depends on you guys, what you teach when you go to prisons, whether you study karma or not, whether you like karma. But for me, this is a major part. You know, that, and I found the number of people in prison, this loosens the, the hopelessness, it loosens the guilt. They realize, yes, they did the action. So then you learn about the purification practice, which I find stupendously powerful. Lama Zopa says, we, we, you know, Lama Zopa says, purification, we're insane not to do it every day. When you understand the way karma works, how every second of the day you're dropping seeds into your karmic bank vaults, and every second of the day, you know, so you, you want to purify, you want to put atomic bombs under the negative seeds. So this is something that many prisons have found so powerful. First step is you regret, you own the fact, I did kill that person. Due to karma, yes. Due to my ignorance, yes, whatever. But I did do it, and you regret it first because I cannot stand the suffering. I don't want the future suffering. It's for yourself. Then you have compassion and you visualize the Buddha. Then you do a practice to purify and then you vow to not do it again. It's the most powerful practice, psychological practice of transforming your mind. So I find that prisoners love the purification practice. So that's my experience. So there's many <coughs> approaches to it, you know, to help prisoners understand why they did it, that you're not, and also that you're not evil in your nature. There's no karma you can't purify. It does not define you. That's the key point that's so powerful. And then also, Massimo, just hearing the Buddhist teachings, which are so profound, which are often given in the Mahamudra teachings and things like that. So in Lama Yeshe, in his latest book coming out last year on Mahamudra, he talks a lot about the pure nature of mind. Buddha's view about how negativity is not intrinsic to us. This is incredibly uplifting, that no matter how bad you've been, you've got the virtue and if you're nothing, there's no negativity you can't change. That is a very profound teaching, I would say, and I've seen directly, has been very uplifting for all of us, not just business. So there's some of my thoughts. So anybody else around, do they have any, are there questions in the chat box there, Massimo, or people in the group would like to ask me a question? Yes. Uh, Good. Um, once is I have a problem with unfolded anger or anguish that triggers when I get into contact with other people. How can I purify this? Would you just say the first part again? I didn't quite hear it properly. I have a problem of unfounded anger. Okay. Or anguish. Sweetheart, yes. whoever you are, I understand because I'm the same kind of person. My mother did not teach me how to be angry. I had perfected anger from the time I was a little girl. Okay, so I do understand. So it's just, this is where practice has to come in. So there's different levels of practice, you know. There's different levels of practice. So in the very first level of practice, and this sounds kind of boring to us in the West, the very first level of practice, before we begin to deal with the anger itself, before we deal with the mind, we have to deal with the servants of our mind, which is your body, and your speech. So someone like me, when I was a little kid, I didn't, I didn't go around raping and killing too many people out of anger, but my speech was the one. You know, if the second I felt the anger, it would vomit out my mouth. And perhaps you're similar yourself. So this is the one we have to fast start to harness. This is not easy. So it's got to be a powerful decision every day. In the morning, you do some kind of practice. You, you can't change overnight, so don't, don't hold your breath. But you've got to know that it's not intrinsic to you. You've got to know that you've got a capability to change gradually. So you be very kind to yourself and very humble. So in the beginning of the day, you have some practice. And then you make a vow for that day. You do your best. I'll do my best to catch the anger before it comes out the mouth. All you can do is start somewhere. 
one step at a time. That's why we would do purification practice at the end of the day. You do some practice in the morning, you make some decisions, you do a practice, and then they watch your body and speech like a hawk throughout the day. And then the end of the day, you do the purification. And the fourth step is, tomorrow I will watch my speech like a hawk and I will try not to vomit out everything I feel. It's a gradual, incremental, slow process. And we've got to realize that. But don't destroy yourself with guilt. Don't over-exaggerate your badness. Don't paint the whole of yourself with the brush of anger because it, does, it isn't everything that you are. Again, that's a powerful point to remember. Because if you just beat yourself up and think, I'm an angry person, I'm an angry person, you're over your own aversion is exaggerating your ugliness. And this, is a, this, is, this destroys us. So be reasonable, be humble, one step at a time, you know, one step at a time. You can't change overnight. What else? Yes. How to teach the children to be not afraid of judgment? Not afraid of other people judging them, do you think yes. that means? Yes. This is very painful. This is very fascinating, this one. So forget children. Look at the rest of us. We haven't learned this. This is, this is pointing, this fear of being criticized by others fear of not being liked by others fear of being judged by others if we look at this all of us this points to the deepest attachment of all and it's so subtle we think it's just normal human behavior but for the buddha this is the deepest attachment this is attachment to being liked attachment to being approved of what i mean by attachment here attachment is this hunger okay attachment is an emotional hunger that feels you're lacking something so when it easy it's easy to recognize attachment to food it's easy to recognize attachment to sex it's easy to recognize attachment to money but attachment to other people approving of me attachment to other people liking me because it is so normal, it's in everybody's mind since we're born, it's so subtle, it's so pervasive, it's so normal that we don't even think it's a problem. So this is quite powerful. It's not easy. It's the hardest one of all, which means, so how do you give it up? Well, first, let's again look at the, the illogic of attachment to other people approving of me. What does that tell us about what we think about ourself. It tells us that I think already I'm not enough. It tells me that. That what I am, just being who I am, isn't enough. I need someone to smile at me and say, Rabina, you're a nice person. Then I'm going to think, oh, wow, I must be okay. So look at this. We must look at this. This is the deepest one we all have. This is the basis of most of our suffering. In other words, attachment is this hunger in us that's looking out there for something to make us happy. Cake, food, music, but this is the one that underpins even those. The hunger coming from, you know, speaking philosophically or psychologically, the, the, this, this attachment is actually the symptom, attachment to anything from the Buddha's view, is a symptom of like a half a person. You're just a half a person. You're not a whole person. You're not, you're not a whole person. You've got to have cake to fill you up. You've got to have music to fill you up. You've got to have music to make you feel satisfied. You've got to have sex and drugs and rock and roll and a house and babies and things. But the biggest one is you've got to have other people smile at you and tell you you're a nice person. Then we'll think we're a nice person. But then we have to get them to say it again. That's why in a relationship that's not healthy and you've got this bottomless pit of emotional hunger that thinks you're no good, so you're always hungry for your boyfriend. Tell me you love me again, darling. And he'll tell me, he'll say, I love you, Rabina, but I'm still, not, I'm still hungry. I want more. So it's like, you'll, it's like it's such suffering, this one. This is the deepest in everybody and it's the hardest attachment to see because it's so primordial. They say it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the, it's the last attachment to go, because it's the closest to ego grasping. They, there's a, there's a, they say the yogis in the mountains who've given up everything are still thinking of what the people in the village are thinking about them. This is primordial. So it's not easy to teach it. But how you can teach it 
You must know it yourself. And then by loving your daughter and giving her praise and telling her what a wonderful person she is, not just out of attachment, but she needs to hear that, but then she's got to take that praise and use it to nourish her own heart and to know that she is in herself a worthwhile person, not just keep relying on mummy telling her she's a worthwhile person. So we need love and compassion and praise from other people, but we have to take it and use it ourselves to build ourselves up. But if we stay like a little vampire, always hungry to hear the right words, we'll stay empty. We will stay miserable. This is our deepest suffering. Yes, another question is victims victims have anger, fear, fault after crime, after um, having... Sorry, would you start that again, please, Massimo? Please say it again. Yes, victims of crimes... Yeah feel anger, fear, yes. fault to be some, have some kind of fault. How can they be outside of the inside prison of, of, a, of this, uh, to be a victim? I don't quite understand the question. Can you say Sorry. it again, please? In so, way. Uh, how to get out of the inside prison of being a victim? This is really hard and it's very, 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 very hard in our culture, in our world. And I would say the main, I mean, you know, um, the main reason, I would just put it from the Buddhist perspective, okay, the, from the Buddhist perspective, when we understand the law of karma, this law that, as far as Buddha is concerned that runs the universe, Buddha did not make it up, he's not a creator, it does not imply punishment, it does not imply reward, which is how we think about karma, that's why we can't stand to think about karma, because we think, well, if I'm a victim, you mean I deserve it? It's too shocking for our minds, because we don't know how to listen to karma properly, you know? So if we understand karma really well, Forget about being the victim of a crime. Let's just look at our own lives. My boyfriend criticizes me and I didn't do anything wrong. I'm devastated. How dare you criticize me? I didn't do anything wrong. And especially in, then even if he does harm me, it's really so heavy for us because we naturally, see this is the point about victim, just speaking philosophically. When we understand the root delusion, ego grasping, this root delusion, this sense, the wrong sense of a separate, bereft, lonely, concrete, nothing me. This is the irony of ego, you know. So that is really, as Lama Yeshi would call it, the self-pity me. It sounds so shocking. So actually ego is a victim. We feel like we're a victim. This is the world. And with respect to our, our philosophical materialist views of the world, we re it reinforces being a victim. I didn't ask to get born, we all say. We really believe we have nothing to do with the person we are. We really believe that a creator made me, my mother and father made me, and they did not consult me, I promise. They plonked me on this planet. So, of course, we feel like a victim. This is the natural way we all feel. Forget about being the victim of a crime. We all feel like a victim, and that's our philosophy. And as far as we're concerned in the materialist world, you are an innocent victim. You didn't ask to get born, so it is not your fault. So if your father harms you, it is not your fault. We, don't th we think that way, so then we think it's good to be a victim. That means it's good to be angry, it's good to find fault, it's good to make sure that person suffers. This is the, the, the energy that suffuses our culture. Now, this doesn't mean we, we throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, oh, well, yes, I got raped. Well, it's just, it's all my fault and, and let the poor guy go. That's not being said either. You've got to be, it's much more nuanced than that. When we understand karma, we, what it does is bring us makes us, like I said about my abortion, it makes us feel that we are, in the, we are in the middle of this interdependent scenario. Me and that baby have some karma together. Me, and So whether it's, you know, um, me and a rapist or me being the harmer, either way, you know. If I'm the harmer and I abuse somebody, that person's the victim. So if we both understand karma and each of us works on our own mind, we will heal it. I will take responsibility for my anger. That person will take responsibility for their part of it and know that from the past karma maybe, and then they will be able to let go of it, therefore have forgiveness of oneself, therefore forgive others. So karma is a power, and this is the Buddhist approach, a powerful tool, you know. But if we don't have that, and we have a lot of anger, and we, and we have been harmed, I mean, people get harmed unbelievably. This is not saying people don't get harmed. People get raped, murdered, terrorized, stolen from, killed. All of this happens on the planet. There's no question. 
So how to heal from it? I mean, all I, all I can do here is talk about the Buddhist view, you know. It's so powerful. But it's what's interesting too is depends on the mind. I mean, you know, one person, let's say a parent, I'm thinking of an example. Let's say a parent, their child is murdered. Well, we would say it's normal to be angry. It's normal to be full of rage. It's normal to want that person to suffer. But not everybody's like that. I always remember my friend Andre in North Carolina who worked, and I think still does, for the prison project. We worked together, and he worked with young... He happens to be black, so he worked with young black men in prison, helping them with, with, you know, with their dramas, and he understands. So his own son got stabbed to death in a bar. And out of the blue, you know, no one expected it. Suddenly his son is dead. And that evening, that evening... He was interviewed on the local television. How do you feel about the murderer of your son? Well, Andre is in, this is so powerful for the television. He was in tears. He said, how can I not have compassion for him? His suffering is only just beginning. So it depends on your mind. You know, he didn't have anger. He understands karma, but his own heart, he's got a big heart and he could see immediately because he works with all of these boys in prison. So he wasn't personal about his own son. Every one of those boys in prison has killed somebody or done something. He sees their heart. So how could I not have compassion for him? He said, his, his suffering is only just beginning. I mean, that's pretty stupendous. So that's no judgment. Oh my God, what a powerful level of compassion, you know? I mean, it's... It's just very fascinating. So it's the karmic one is one major one, but you can't force that on somebody. I mean, if people come to me for advice and if a person's in r angry because they've been raped or even just harmed by their boyfriend, it depends on the person. I'm not going to give them a lecture about karma. It depends on that person and where that person is at. You can't just dump karma on people. But a person's got to be ready to hear this and many people don't, aren't, aren't interested in karma. So then you have to help that person heal. And this is the and so another point that's major if we're trying to help other people. Let's say you're working with a person in a prison who has themselves been a victim, you know, and they're full of rage and resentment and bitterness. One of the key things that I think is really powerful but takes a long time to see, it takes great courage. Forget karma, forget everything, but look at this. If we get, and this is Buddha's key point, if we at the very first level of practice in the wisdom wing, what Buddha is getting us to see ourselves is that my attachment, my guilt, my rage, my anger, my despair, my depression, they are what cause me suffering. Yes, I got raped. Yes, my boyfriend was abusive. Yes, that person stole from me. We're not denying those facts. Keep those facts away. This is profound. You don't need to worry about karma for this one. If we can help another person see the pain that their own anger and, dis and rage is causing them. This is profound, I tell you. And, but, and that doesn't need karma. That doesn't even need Buddhism. It's common sense. But we're so addicted to believing when we're a victim. It's not being mean. We're all victims. We, we have the view. The victim has the view, I have a right to be angry. Look at what she did to me. I'm allowed to be jealous. This is what keeps us paralyzed. And we go mad, literally go mad, you know. So all of this work demands a lot of accountability. It demands the courage to look into our mind, you know. It's incredible. I mean, this is where I use extreme examples and I find them so powerful. And I always use this example. One of my friends in prison, who was in prison, she's now out of prison. And I read about her when she, years ago, before I met her, her name is Sunny. And she wrote a book and she's quite well known a little bit in America, in the prison world, you know. And she was this young hippie, this nice Jewish girl, a hippie with two sons or something, I forget and a husband, hitching in Florida in the 70s. And I forget the exact details, but she got they got picked up, they were hitching, and they got picked up by two guys. Then the police stopped the car, and the two guys killed the, killed the policeman and blamed the hippies. So they're on death row in Florida. I mean, it was the most nightmarish story you could ever imagine. Talk about victim. I mean, talk about valid victim, you know. Completely innocent hippie. And then suddenly, out of the blue. Now, she has, she's not a Buddhist, she does. She did yoga. She and I know her now. I'm, our, my body, she to trust is supporting her work in Ireland. She's married to a fellow who was also accused of murder in Ireland during all the troubles there. And they're both old people now, helping people in, coming out of prison. They're doing a wonderful job. But her story is insane. You know, she was this young woman 
on, de on death row in isolation, year after year in isolation. Her husband was eventually executed. She even went to the execution and his head burst into flames. I mean, you can't even imagine the nightmare. Then her two children, at least they were with her, with her own parents. Her parents got killed in a car accident, so she lost her children. They were given to the state. So she lost her kids. Her parents were killed. Her husband's head burst into flames on death row. They're innocent. Can you imagine? I mean, that's the best victim in the world. But she somehow, she's not a Buddhist. Even now when we talk, she has no interest in karma, you know. But she had this incredible, all I can call it is emotional intelligence, you know. She had and not much anger. This for me is most powerful. She didn't have much anger. So that meant she had more space in her mind to, to see possibilities, which is so courageous, I can't believe it. For years in isolation, just with herself and the process she had to go through to learn to come to terms with it. And the essence of it was, she said, that she, she said at some point, I realized I could not change anything, but they couldn't take my mind from me. This is her point, you know. At some point she said, I knew I had the choice to think differently. I knew, she said, I decided I am not a prisoner. I'm a monk. I am not in a cell. I'm in a cave. I mean, this is so courageous, so amazing, so unbelievable. That's almost, it seems like fantasy, you know, because the normal behavior, being innocent, and this is really common in America, so many people on death row, especially the racist, unbelievable, shocking policies, the, 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 the corruption of their legal processes, the corruption of, their, of the way their judges are, are appointed and the, and the attorneys. And it's just awful, you know, such a corrupt system, in my opinion, based on what I've seen. I mean, there are amazing good people there. Of course there are. How can I be so rude? But this woman, she, she became powerful in her own ability to realize that she had a mind and she realized, without even saying these words, that her nightmare would be perpetuated if she kept being angry, kept being enraged, kept feeling like a victim. She knew she could change her mind. So what was the consequence of this? 17 years living in prison, she finally got out. But the interesting point was... She stopped feeling like a victim, but she didn't lose any common sense. She knew technically she was a victim since she had been wrongly accused. So she never lost sight of that. So she never stopped working on her freedom and she got her freedom eventually. And she's a happy, content, fulfilled, whole person now. I met many people who've been in prison who are emotionally kind of really tortured, really injured, broken, you know, because they don't know how to work on their minds. But Sunny knew how to work on her mind. And when you meet her now, she's like this little friendly old lady. You would never imagine in a million years the history that she's got because she worked on her mind. She's an amazing example for me. So that's a long answer to that question. Any other questions? No other questions, Massimo? I can't hear you, darling. You unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I'm uh, unmuting myself. Yeah. Uh, the first time you, you meet a prisoner, uh, what is the first advice or teaching you give to him or to her? And how to help them to uh, keep high the motivation in practice to work with them? I understand that, yes, exactly. Exactly. It's got to be, you've got to be, you've, I mean, okay, again, I'll just describe the process that I went through, because it's my experience. All I can tell you is my experience. That I got a letter. There I was editing Mandela, this magazine, and there's 96, April or February or something, I forget, and this letter came, and it came on my desk because it was addressed to Mandela magazine, and I was the editor. So actually, I let it sit there for two months. I didn't answer it. I just let this, I kept putting it off, you know. I'd never heard, a, I'd never met a prisoner before. So then finally I answered the letter and I sent him a book because his letter was very moving. He said he was, you know, he told me his brief story, very brief. He'd read a book by Lama Yeshi. He was moved by the talk of compassion. He said he'd been in prison, gang since he's 11, in prison since he's 12, and now in three life sentences as an adult in California. So I read the details and straight away, I mean, what was evident to me was that he was sincere. I felt he was sincere and it was kind of intense situation, you know. And this is the thing, how it, how it took time to begin. I realized I couldn't just send him a, a website, you know, go, get, go buy this book, which is what you do with normal people. I had to write a letter, I had to get a book, I had to send him a book. So the thing was, first of all, the first thing has to be 
that you see, you have to see the good heart in there. He wants something. He, you know, he's 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 reaching out, and then you realise he's in prison with no. He's in his cell twenty three hours a day, no money. I I, I indic- this is indicated. No friends, no family, no money. He managed to get a stamp. He managed to write a letter and to post it, asking for help. So that was something so undeniable. And where was that letter? That letter was on my desk, not somebody else's. So the first thing had to be, you know, I had. To, First thing was, well, the first thing was, oh, what can I do, you know? He's writing to me, what can I do? So then I think, I, can't, I can write him a letter, but he needs a book. Sitting there 24 hours a day, watching his own breath, what good is that? He needs a book. He needs something to read, you know? So I had to find a book. So where did the book come from? Well, I had to get some money. Well, we didn't have any budget. So the thought was, that the, what I'm getting at is, it became a strong, week. and then before I knew it, a second letter, and then a third letter. And in one year, by that point, 40 people were writing. So every time a letter would come, I'd have to think, what, there is this guy showing he wants something. He looks sincere, but what am I going to do? I haven't got any money. There's no money in Mandela. I was a nun. I got a, you know, a few dollars in my pocket every month. But you have to have the, con- the wish, not out of attachment, not out of sentimental, not out of... Oh, the poor thing, you know. Out of a, you've got to have a sincere wish to help somebody. And because they have no choice but to do it right, they can't go to a website, they have no money, you have to have this wish to help. And that's not easy when you've got a busy life, you know. You've got to have a wish to help. And then you let it grow from there. But that's, to sustain that is not easy. Because what I've found with people in prison, if you speak from the point of view of karma, They've got very little good karma. You've got to work 10 times harder to help people in prison than anybody else, you know. You've got to work 10 times harder. So you've got to have enthusiasm for it, which means it can't be just driven by attachment. Otherwise, you'll give up in five minutes. And that's not easy. That's not easy, you know, to have the wish to help another person. But also not to... It's just to sort of take it one step at a time, I think. And then the other point was, for me, you know, they wrote to me... But I got to get someone to help me. I could only write to so many people. I had to have, you've got to have also, this sounds really silly. Okay, this is not quite the same as one person going into prison. But this is what I, I admire about Lara and other people in the prison project in Italy. You know, you, like we did in America. If I just wrote to one prisoner, I could be very happily writing to that same prisoner 25 years later and I wouldn't help another single human being, you know. So then that's why you need organisation. This is another discussion now. You've got to see how can I get set up an organisation? How can we get the funds? How can we educate people? Because that's how it can grow. But the person on their own is just to have the wish to help, to see the good heart in that person in front of you, and to not exaggerate, don't vomit out all sorts of advice, don't be sentimental, but recognise where that person is from, coming from, what can they do, give them what they like. But don't have too many expectations, because what I saw also, of maybe we get 1,000 letters a month when I was working at the prison project, I don't know how many letters they get now, maybe, you know, 5% of the prisoners who ended up staying as Buddhist. Don't expect everybody to become a Buddhist. Even many of the young men I helped in prison personally for years, writing to them, sending books, taking their phone calls, giving them refuge, giving them bodhisattva vows. When they left prison, I never heard another word. So you can't have attachment. You can't have expectations. You do what you can. You be reasonable. You take it one step at a time. You don't over-exaggerate. You don't think of yourself like a saint. You don't get all caught up in nonsense. You help in any way you can with no expectation of of them ever doing anything again, you know. I mean, that was why also for us, many of the prisoners would write for a while, they'd become Buddhists, we'd give them books, then they'd write very nicely, they were very sweet. One guy wrote and said, thank you very much, I've decided to become a Muslim. We wrote a sweet letter back, we're so happy for you. So you can't have any expectations. I mean, this is trouble in our relationships, even with each other. If you have have attachment to somebody and then you try to help them, we get very sentimental. And then when they don't respond the way we want them to, we get upset with them. That's just attachment. So you have, to have a t- you have to have compassion, do what you can, no expectations, and take it one step at a time, you know. I mean, it's a big answer as usual. All I can tell you is all that. Yeah. Can you talk uh, about uh, self-judgment uh, and um, how to bring, uh, because everybody of us is, is judgmental, no? has a judgmental um, attitude. And um, uh, it's very strong, the, the sense of self-judgment. Uh, can you talk about self-judgment and yes. can be the mind free from judgment? Well, that's, that's, I mean, if we're talking Buddhist view, that's, that's the point. Buddha says, yes, delusions, anger, which is all, you're, you're, you're saying judgment, I'm calling it anger. Of course, it's just not at the core of our being. 
And that's why if a person is using Buddhism, you've got to know this, and it's very encouraging that it's not, it, it's not intrinsic to you. It doesn't define you. It isn't who you really are. And then when you understand that you know, judgment of yourself, which we call self-hate or guilt, is exactly the same as anger. So this is where, the, the pur like for example, the purification practice we do in the Tibetan Buddhist approach. At the end of the day, it's very practical psychology, you know. So it's really like this process you do at the end of the day, and I call it like being your own friend. So there's four steps, the four R's in English, you know. And the first one is really crucial. Sometimes it, they teach it in a different order, but I find this order so helpful. And the first one, and in English we use the word regret. So, or remorse, depends on which language you're using here. So I remember this one person, this is, this is the point, the clear point. One person asked the Dalai Lama, what is the difference between guilt, self-hate, judgment, whatever word you like, and regret? And this is the key point. If we can understand this, we are on the right track. It's again, it's distinguishing between the facts and the fictions. It's exactly the same. So it was so simple the way His Holiness answered. He said, guilt which is self-hate. So what guilt is? Guilt is anger towards yourself. You are the object instead of somebody else. And, it, and what the key function of all the delusions, and this is the Buddhist psychological explanation, the key function of all the unhappy emotions, attachment, anger, jealousy, they, the key function is they exaggerate. Attachment exaggerates the deliciousness of my handsome boyfriend. Anger exaggerates the ugliness of my boyfriend when he cheats on me. So they always exaggerate. They paint an exaggerated picture. So guilt is anger. Guilt is anger and you are the object of it. So what it does, you are over-exaggerating your own badness. That's the key point. You're over so on the basis of doing this bad action and this bad action and that bad action, you say, I am a bad person. So His Holiness answered, guilt is you look in the past, and, and this is now this is the facts. I, I kicked the dog. I was cheated on my partner. I was angry with my mother. Now, they're facts. But then you conclude with guilt, Therefore, I'm a bad person. And that's what, that's what anger is. If I say, you did this, and you did that, and you did this, you are a bad person. That's exactly how anger or judgment works. We do see a fact there. That person in prison did kill somebody. And then we say, and he is therefore evil. That's really common in society. Yourself, I did ki kill the dog. I did have an abortion. I did cheat on my partner. And then we think about it, we go on about it, and we exaggerate that badness and we paint the whole of ourself. We define the whole of me. Therefore, I'm a bad person. Now, we're not, we don't do it in such an articulate way. It's just instinctive because we have got so much anger in our minds. It's so automatic. So we've got to unpack this. So then his holiness was so simple. He said, what's regret? This, this healthy attitude. He said, the first part is exactly the same. I did kill the boyfriend. I did rape the baby. I'm sorry, rape the boyfriend, kill the girlfriend, whatever it was. Whatever you did wrong, okay? I did do it. I, and this takes courage. This takes courage. I did do that. I did do this. And this is why we have to think about it and unpack it instead of instinctively running to, therefore, I'm a bad person. And that happens so quickly, it's almost like the same thought. We think almost simultaneously, I did that, therefore, I'm bad. We've got to change that. We've got to acknowledge, I did do it. But then you say, what can I do to change it? What can I do to fix it? What can I do to heal it, you know? And that takes time. But the other component in there, and this is where the first part, this first step in the purification practice is so powerful. We've got to speak it out. And this is very hard for us in our culture to think this. This is related to the business of karma. The whole Buddhist idea is everything I think and do and say will necessarily program me and turn me into the person I become. This is the natural law of karma. Buddha says this is so, Dalai Lama calls it self-creation. This takes a while for us in our culture to think about this, you know, because we hear it as punishment and reward. That's instinctive. But it's not like that at all. It's a natural law. Equally, then all the negative things I do, 
A negative action, technically speaking, is a heavy negative action is an action I do with my body or speech that's driven by anger or driven by attachment or driven by jealousy, etc., etc. Now, a virtuous action is exactly the same. It's an action done with my body and speech driven by kindness, driven by love, driven by generosity. So one is a negative action. That will sow a seed in my mind that will program me in that action, in that activity, in that mental state. I mean, it's fairly obvious. And a virtuous action will do exactly the same. And these seeds will eventually ripen in the future as my suffering and my happiness. This is just the way the universe runs, Buddha says. No one made it up. No one created it. No one runs it. It's a natural law. This takes time for us to think through. But we've got to think it through like this. So, I did have that abortion. Out of my ignorance. I didn't think of it as killing a baby. I did cheat on my boyfriend. I didn't think of it as wrong. Maybe I sort of did. I did it based on how I was at that time. I was ignorant. I didn't know. And this is the point now. I didn't know that doing those actions would harm me. This is regret. Regret has got nothing to do with compassion yet. That comes second. We've got to get this attitude for ourselves. This takes time. In fact, we think this is selfish in the West. We think, oh, no, I, I'm not suffering. I've got to have compassion. That's come second. You've got to have compassion for yourself first. That to know that every action I do pollutes me, harms me, hurts me. You've got to have this kindness toward yourself. So I regret the abortion. Why? Regret isn't, oh, I shouldn't have done it. I'm a bad person. That's useless. Regret is not like, well, I didn't know any better, so why should I regret it? It's like you've eaten poison last week. It's too late to change it, but suddenly you realise it's, it's harming you. So, of course, you have to regret it. And then you think, well, whom can I turn to? Where's the medicine to purify it before it ripens as my suffering? This is all based on karma, and we've got to spell it out. It's very logical, and it's compassion for ourselves. So regret is, I did do this, and I did do this out of my foolishness, out of my stupidity. You know, I didn't know I was harming myself. I didn't know I was causing future harm. So I regret that from the depths of my heart because I do not want more suffering, because I am sick of suffering. That's the attitude of regret, and it's wholesome. It's self-respectful. But we've got to spell it out. We've got to think it through. It's logical psychology, and it's the opposite of guilt. Guilt is just, I'm hurt. Guilt is useless. Guilt, you can't go anywhere. It's just stuck. You're stuck. It's useless. There's no responsibility there. You just drown in misery. You can't go anywhere with it. And this destroys so many people. It's heartbreaking. So then the next step, you, you then think, well, whom can I turn to? Where's the medicine? Use Buddha. You don't, Buddha won't fix you, but you use Buddha's techniques and you heal yourself. It's a very practical process. So I hope that answered some of the questions. Yes, Grazie. Among the many parts of the mind involvement in judgment, what delusion is predominant? Anger. And what we... Anger. Anger. It's clear. Anger. 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 Over exaggerating your badness or somebody else's. It's called anger. And anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. That's it. That's the answer. So then, next part of the question. Yes. And what would be the most powerful thoughts counteracting it and i had another question very connected to especially with the you know in our daily life especially with people closely related to us when we already have a contaminated vision of them and that's a very good point okay let's talk about that let's say you, you let's say you got some you know difficulty with your with your sister so first you recognize okay forget the karmic one but for whatever reason, you and your sister just don't get along. And this is not uncommon, okay? I remember, my, okay, again, I'll use my own example, okay? Why not? So one of my, I've got seven siblings. There are seven of us, all very close in age. My mummy was a Catholic. And she just poured forth babies, one after another. She had eight in a row, I think. And she started when she was 34. This is incidental. I'm just telling you my story. And there were seven daughters and then a son. You can imagine when my son, my brother got born. The whole neighbourhood celebrated. It was amazing. Anyway, the point is this. My older sister, Janet, she was 12 months, 12 months older than me. So we had this intense relationship from the time we remember. So, okay, karma's the cause, but I'll just tell you. So I loved, I, I mean, I see photos of me with my older sister. I'm always leaning into her. I, see, I always wanted her to love me, you know, but she was mean to me. 
Now, I was the bully in the family. I bullied my sisters. I bullied everybody. But my sister, uh, and I'm cross-eyed, okay? You know, cross-eyed, my eye goes in. Since a little girl, I've been wearing glasses, okay? And my eye goes right in. I couldn't see anything. So my sister, Janet, was mean to me. She'd be nasty. And she would just have to say to me, cock-eye. I don't know what you say in the other languages. Cock-eye. I would just burst into tears of self-pity and misery and absolutely destroyed you know she was always mean to me we had this intense relationship we loved each other but she was mean to me now whether she was jealous I don't know but I just wanted her love you know so as we got older it was like this as it was as I got older and I was and I'd just get so upset with my sister Janet and I'd be respond to her second she'd say something mean I'd leap into it like a baby you know so I mean before I was a Buddhist even before I was a Buddhist I decided this had to change I decided and this is what I'm getting at, I had to see her differently. I had to see her differently. I had to look and see her differently. Already in my life, I'd painted a picture of my sister. You know, I'd painted a picture of mean Janet. That's what we do. We all do this every single day. We're painting a picture every single day. And what paints the picture? Attachment. If you adore your sister, you, you see her as beautiful. You look forward to seeing her. And so you paint the whole of your sister as gorgeous. Now, she might even be more angry than your other sister. But you don't care because she's not angry to you. So we're always painting a picture. Attachment paints a delicious picture, which means it blinds you from seeing the, the, all the qualities Anger painted a picture of my sister Janet and she was angry with me. So I decided one day and something miraculous happened, I didn't respond in the same way that I had spent my life responding. So from that time, it was like I'd suddenly painted a new picture of my sister, you know. So, <coughs> okay, good. Okay, so what I'm really saying is, and this is so difficult, you know, you've literally got to paint a new picture of the person. So what does that mean? Well, you've got to start remember. I and mean, all that means is you've got to start, almost like you make a list. Right now, if you make a list of the qualities of the person you don't like, you're going to have a, a very long list of their bad qualities. This is really logical. So that's anger's view. So what you're going to do is you're going to write another list this time. And I really mean it sincerely. You've got to be very rational with your mind because you know, you've got to start writing a list of her good qualities. And I really, I swear to you, this is so profound, but it sounds like a joke. Because anger only sees bad qualities. Now, I mean, you know, in other words, if I think of this man on death row in Kentucky, whom I know. Now, I didn't, he didn't tell me what he did. But as my friend Mitchell said, Rabina, he thinks of torture all the time. Now, you can imagine if he wrote down every single negative thought he had, you would not, you'd be so horrified, you'd just see a monster. You would just see a monster. Now, I happen to know the guy, so I don't know what his mind is doing, but I see other aspects of him. He's fairly patient, he's kind to the other guys, so they're true, they're, they're true statements. So you've got to find a way to see good qualities. And literally, before you know it, you start to see the person in a different way and you'll feel differently. Of course it takes time. But you've got to understand the function of anger, how anger in your mind is drawing. And the fact is, she might have done those mean things. My sister was mean to me. But there's other qualities there that you're blind and can't see because the bad qualities take over. So this is really hard work and it takes much humility and much uh, hard work, but it's possible. It's literally possible. And if they are crazy, still keep out of the way. If this crazy guy on death row, if he's addicted to torture, I will make sure I don't give him an opportunity to torture me. That doesn't contradict it. That doesn't mean I can't see the good qualities in him. And this is not meant to be sentimental. This is where you get into the compassion wing of practice. And you start, you, you know, this is where the bodhisattvas have super clarity. They've got wisdom. They don't have attachment anymore, don't have anger. So they're seeing exactly the person. They see the psychopath. They see the pedophile. They see the torturer. But they also see the good qualities and they also see their potential. So because they're wise, they can learn to know how to help that person and have real compassion for them. Why? because that person is causing themselves suffering, not to mention the, the, people, the, the people they harm. And this is the really powerful point about compassion. There's another story I always tell. And that's when I was in New York, 
to, sorry, living in America. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm in America. What am I doing? I'm confused. And I was in California running the prison project. This was in 2003. And uh, Richard Gere contacted us and wanted to sort of collaborate on doing some kind of work with ex-prisoners for when the Dalai Lama was going to come. He was inviting. So in the end, he did his own thing. But he, he, what he did was he invited 20 former prisoners, all of whom had done some kind of meditation in prison to come to this big event to meet the Dalai Lama and come to all the teachings. And it was a wonderful day, and he invited a couple of people like me as well, who obviously had been working with people in prison. It was a very moving day, you know. He, uh, and so all these different people, black, a whole cross, range, a cross section of Americans, black, white, Puerto Rican, Mexican, male, female, and a couple of the prisons that we'd worked with in prison as well. So it was a wonderful day. They had wonderful communication. They met the Dalai Lama. That was gorgeous, a wonderful day. But he also invited two young Tibetan nuns who'd been imprisoned, sexually abused, and tortured in Tibet. So they were telling their story. So obviously there they are, these Tibetan Buddhists, Little, since little girls, they brought up with the view of karma. And we have to remember the view of karma isn't just some weird, wacky idea that's been tacked onto the end of Buddhism. It's a fundamental part of the entire world view of Buddhism that's been around well before the Buddha, you know. These Indians observed this. So it's something quite profound. And it's dealt with an immense depth and breadth in the literature. So there's this, this young nun. I mean, 99% of the Tibetans were, were Buddhist, you know. I think in the I think the I think the uh, Jesuits in the Middle Ages the Jesuits went all eager to to convert the Tibetans. You know they went all the way to the Himalayas and went to Tibet. They even translated the Bible into Tibetan, but the Tibetans could not care less. They couldn't get one Christian, so they gave up. Anyway, that's just that story. So anyway, they're almost all Tibetans. There's a couple of Muslims, I think. So they're all, all Buddhists, basically. So they're brought up with this view. It's in the same way that we people in the West are just brought up with the view of materialism, neuroscience, the brain. It's just second nature to us. It's just the world as far as we're concerned, you know. It's just reality. Well, karma is their reality. It's something completely in their mind, completely implicit. It informs everything they do, they think. It's just deeply in their minds. So that's already the first point. The next point is, of course, because they don't have... Because they've got the view of karma, and this is very shocking to hear this, but this is really powerful. If you philosophic, if you if you look into the mind and, and look at the philosophy of anger, the philosophy of attachment, they are the view of a victim. What does anger say? How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. That's what anger's saying. I mean, that is what anger's saying. And if we are having the materialist philosophical view, with respect, that is a correct view. I never met that rapist in my whole life. And look what they're doing to me. How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. That fits with our philosophy. But not for these Buddhist nuns. They have a view of karma. So they don't even, and this is very shocking, they don't even have anger. Dalai Lama said one of the saddest things for him since their exile is now seeing that more and more Tibetans now have anger. That means they don't have the view of karma. This is pretty profound, you know. It's very fascinating. So these young women, there they were, knowing why they're there. They have the view of karma. It's very confident. They don't ever rage on, why is this happening to us? Why are we... They didn't have that view. But they had to deal with the suffering every single day, by working on their minds, doing their practice, doing their purification, struggling with the suffering, being abused, being tortured. I mean, can you imagine the suffering? Unbelievable. But they had their tools. Finally, they were released. There they were telling their story. There was no anger. Surprising for the Americans. And, but there were tears, you know. And one of the nuns said at the end, and of course we had compassion for our torturers because we know we must have harmed them in the past. And because we know they will suffer in the future because of the, the suffering they've caused us. That's the law of karma. And when you've got the law of karma down in the wisdom wing and you, are, you understand your own mind, you understand attachment, you understand anger, you've unpacked all these delusions, you've, you've turned into this marvellous, content, fulfilled person, that's what you get when you get renunciation. You, be, you become this marvellous, content person. You've given up attachment, you've given up anger, you've given up blame, you've given up victim. You become fulfilled, you become joyful. This is not a joke, you know. This is the wisdom wing. 
Then on the basis of this, you can go to the compassion wing and you can go, oh my God, we are all in the same boat. Look at this. And then it's easy to have compassion for everybody based upon the work you have done by looking into the Four Noble Truths for you and practicing that for you. Then it's not that difficult to have this level of compassion. And I forgot what your question was, but there's my answer. Yes, you heard sort of another question. There are some other questions here. So, uh, are there any books of, or house or not Buddhist to suggest to prisoner? I don't know uh, idea. I don't know idea. idea. I don't know the answer to that question. That are not Buddhist, okay. you're saying? That are not Buddhist? Yeah. I've absolutely no idea. I'm so sorry. I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit of a fanatic Buddhist. I try to talk like a normal person, but I always use, I figure that, you know, Buddhist psychology written in the most down-to-earth way can appeal to everybody because it's not fundamentalist. It's not, it's not dogmatic, you know. So I'm, I'm a Buddhist. I'm sorry, I can't tell you any books. Uh, for the prisoner, again, how to help them in recognizing their inner good qualities like kindness are there any practice or reflection? yes doing exactly what i said before for other people you do it for yourself start to look at your good qualities but i'll tell you massimo this is the hardest job in the whole damn world we somehow do not like to point out our good qualities we are addicted when we're really caught up in ego this is the irony of ego we are completely addicted to the bad picture of me. We just believe one billion percent and hold on to that like it's just astonishing, but we all do the same. I mean, there are good qualities right in us this second, but you know, even if someone else tells us, I mean, someone can tell me 47 times, you're a nice person, Rabina, you're actually quite generous, you're this, you're that, and I will say, no, I'm not. And then 47 times a person can praise me and I won't believe it. But look what happens when one person criticizes me. I will believe it. So this shows what we think of ourselves, which is self-loathing. This is the terrible irony of, a, of, of, of ego. So we have to, fi have to find our good qualities. Now that's Sunny. I would say that Sunny in prison, she had that capacity. She was, why she could change her mind? Well, she had some self-respect. She knew she could. She knew she could do it. She had self-respect and confidence. This is profound. So we've got to learn to paint a new picture of ourselves. It's so intense. Okay. Yeah. In Liberation Prison Project, there was a thing that you would have loved to do that was not possible or not possible yet to realize. One thing in your heart that you wish Yeah, to have hundreds of trillions of dollars and give them all really good education, all the books they need, make their prisons reasonable as long as they have to be there and get a lot of them out, of course. Or get them, send them all to Norway. I never forget, I had this Norwegian friend who emailed me, Rabina, I am so looking forward to going to prison. I'm going to this lovely prison in the country where there's two years, he's going to get educated and get some discipline and have all these kind of, in the, in the, in the, in the countryside, a beautiful prison, because in Norway, they, they want to educate people and make them happy. He was so excited about going to prison. So make all the prisons like that, at least. That's what I'd like to do. A few trillion dollars are needed, certainly in America. Okay? Yes. Yeah. If a person becomes uh, an object of violence... An object? What, what do you mean an object? That... Sorry. What do you mean an object of violence? Uh, I think that uh, she received the violence. Oh, okay. Someone she... is violent to you. Yeah. What about yes. him? Go on. What to do? What this person can do? Distance himself, herself? I understand. Well, I mean, it depends on the context. If, if it's my boyfriend, if it's my mother, if I'm five and they're 20, it all depends on the context. So I can, I can answer six different ways. But if it's a relationship, a typical relationship of a boyfriend and a girlfriend or two boyfriends or whatever it might be, this is where the victim one plays out. I mean, you know, I always quote, they say in the United Nations, there's some number, that there's a general thing, accepted number, that 40% of all women who get murdered on this planet are murdered by the bloke in the same bed. Pretty much. So what does that tell us? This is not against men. This is talking about attachment. Idiot. 
total attachment, victim mentality. I'm not being rude to anybody, but this is the suffering of attachment. When you've got enormous attachment, you have emotional hunger. You think you're nobody, so you rely on somebody else to make you think you're important. So you have a relationship, you have a fantasy, and then he starts to beat you up, or she beats him up, or whatever. And then you think, oh, he really still does love me. You just keep going back like a moth to a flame, because you have no self-respect. You have no recognition of your own power. You have no feeling that you can do anything Thing about it so you keep going back and then one day you kill him or you he kills you one or the other this just shows how utterly disconnected we are from our own minds we have no sense of self-respect we have no awareness we dump all our junk onto everybody else you know this is a total tragedy so i forget your question what was the question again are you in your violent? Okay, okay, okay. Now, this according, the answer is according to where you are at in your own mind. If I'm in that victim level, and it's the, you know, which, which is the no self respect, no self awareness, lots of fear, not believing I can live on my own, no thought I could possibly escape, oh, I couldn't do that, or, and that's the suffering of a victim. It's not being, it's being horrible, it's being really compassionate. A victim is a person who has no self respect, no awareness that they can live on their own no belief they could be do, could walk away tomorrow and this is a i mean forget even a person being violent to us so many of us live in relationships or work in a in a company where we the boss is horrible the colleagues are horrible you hate the job there's no benefit or you're in a relationship but we just we are so paralyzed we don't know we don't we can't make choices in other words one, if I'm in a miserable relationship and the person's abusing me and my friend says, well, Rabina, you know you could leave him. Well, no, the first thing is not, don't be ridiculous. Of course I couldn't. Where would I go? I have no money. I can't do it. Not possible. And now this is the other part. We not only don't have the power to know we can do that, and in fact, anybody could do that, but if you don't think you can do it, and that's the victim mind, it doesn't even occur to you that you could leave. You give all these 47 reasons why you can't leave. Oh, they won't approve. Oh, he won't, he, the children will be upset. Oh, my mother won't allow. Oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. We have so much fear. We have no ability to have the courage to make a decision to change our situation. And this is the irony. We're not in prison. But in a relationship, you might as well be in prison. It might as well be that your husband is locking you in that relationship. That's how hopeless we feel. This is the shocking part. This is why Sonny said, I knew I had the choice. But we don't even, not only do we not know when we are victims that we could leave that abusive husband, that abusive boss, that abusive sister, not only do we not believe we can leave the situation, we then I will say to my friend, then, well, you know, you could change your mind. You could decide to be different and you could decide to be more powerful and, you know, and become more strong and stop being like a victim. So then he'll start changing or you can start getting him to change or you can start beating him up yourself. I mean, I'm just joking. No, no, I can't do that as well. No, he is a monster. No, I, you know, we, we don't even, not only do we not know we can move our situation, you're not in prison, but we don't even know we can change our mind. That's the suffering of most of us on this planet. That's our suffering. We're becoming, we're just hopeless, have no awareness, no self-respect, and live in misery. And I'm not even talking about obvious abuse in relationships. The number of people who live in garbage relationships where there's no communication, there's no kindness, there's just bitterness and anger, and it's all suffocated, and they live in the same bed. I mean, I hyperventilate at the thought of that. I'd rather go to prison than live like that. And the number of people in the world who live their lives like that just, just unbelievable. It's just so terrifying. You know, because we have no awareness, no self-respect. We feel like a victim. We're too scared to make a decision because we're scared of what people think mostly. We're terrified of what people think. This is an extra little one here. It's an extra thing that I always like to tell. And, you know, that can be for any of us. This woman I read about years ago, an Australian nurse who did a book, wrote a book. She worked with the dying and she wrote a book called The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. And what was so fascinating, the main regret was that I didn't follow my heart. I didn't do what I really knew I wanted to do. I did what was I thought 
other people expected me to do. And that's the suffering of attachment to reputation. And that's what keeps us paralysed. That's what keeps us to be victims. And that's what, you know, <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> and of course it's not that easy. I mean, no one says this is easy when you're in this incredible karmic relationship with an abuser. It's not easy. No one says this is easy. But this is where Sunny is such a good example. She was being abused by the law, by the police, by everybody. She was able to change her mind. I mean, all we can do is aim for that. I'm not saying it's easy. But we have to have the thought, what can I do? How can I change something? And from that, you know, we can grow. It's not easy. And when you, you know, when you understand karma, the relation, the karmic relationship from the past lives is so powerful. But like in some people, like in some relationships, like in some cultures, and it certainly used to be in everywhere, but I mean, some cultures are still very powerful. And I call it this, I'm not trying to be rude, the tyranny of families. That, you know, when mother and father run everything. I remember talking to one girl, doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter. And the because the parents were so, in her mind, their culture was that the parents ran everything. You just had to do what they said. And even when I made a suggestion that she might leave home, it was like I was suggesting that she kill somebody. It was so shocking to her. It was not possible for her mind to even consider that she could possibly ever do something like that. So that depend that's the strength of the karma between people. I remember some crazy story. This is a ridiculous, hilarious story reading about these two people who got married and then very soon, American couple, and then very soon started abusing each other equally. They lived together for 40 years, throwing pots and pans at each other, punching, kicking, abusing, screaming equally. Then one day he left, the husband left after like 40 years, you know. But then, he, and then she moved into a studio apartment, like with no bedroom, just a room. But he came back. And someone said, why'd you let him back? Because they're both abusive. She said, oh, you know, this is the strength of karma. This is the power of karmic relationships. So he, they came back, he came back, so now they divided the room with a sheet. But every day, throwing pots and pans and kicking and screaming and abusing each other, every single day. Now, you'd think that's the behaviour of a maniac, right? And demented people. But this is the power of karma and the power of our crazy delusions, you know. No wonder the bodhisattvas have compassion for us. There is one last question, uh, if we have time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, regarding to attachment to reputation, is yes. there a particular meditation that you re would recommend? No, I mean, the whole path is the practice. There's no quick meditation, but an attitude to cultivate. I mean, the meditation will be if you do your mindfulness and start to notice it. I mean, all of these are thoughts, but they're so deep in us, we don't think of them as thoughts. So the key job... Yeah, is to recognize the thoughts beneath the emotions. And then the more you hear when you read Buddhist psychology, you read all these different concepts, then you start to think, okay, I better start to search for that one. I better start to notice it. So that's the meditation. Of course it is. You've got to recognize it's a thought. And then you'll start to see, even in your own mind, you're thinking all the time. When you do something that's good, what you, immediately what we'll do is we'll be telling somebody in our mind. Like if you, if, let's say you've gone to work, or anything, you're at work, you're driving home from work, <clears throat> and your husband's at home, and you see something special on the road, already in your mind, you're telling your husband. That's a sign that you, you know, we call it sharing. And it's nice to share things, but we, when we have relationships, we don't think that having the thought ourselves, we don't think that's valuable. We don't think that's enough. We have to tell somebody. We have to share it with somebody. And that's why people have loneliness. Oh, I've got no one to share my thoughts with. So I'm just talking about it again. We've got to start recognizing it. So you do your concentration meditation, maybe for five minutes, you try to catch these thoughts. That's how. Okay, people. That's Emile. Thank you very much. Time to go home, I think. Look, I'm running out of voice. And my lips are... I think just... we have finished all the questions. Good, Rubina. I'm so happy. Wow, wow, super great. Good, Lara. So, um, maybe we, you want to dedicate... Uh, yes, just do a little... Just ask, well, just, yeah, yeah. Just, just think, everybody. Were... Don't, I'll sing a little prayer, but just think, think. Here we've been for two hours, okay? I mean, I've been yeah. doing all the talking, I know that. But just think, 
any all these thoughts that we have had, including me, every single one of those thoughts has sown a seed in our mind. They say in Buddhist psychology, there's not a single thought we have that ever goes astray. Everything gets stored. This is very encouraging, you know. So we think all these two hours, all these thoughts, if, if all the seeds, have, the seeds have gone in, so we think, may we nourish these seeds with our own effort, our own practice from this second forward to continue to develop our marvellous potential, to continue to benefit others. That's it, really. That's the essence of it. And I'll just sing the little jo the, the bodhicitta prayer. Chang chob sem chog rinpoche, ma kye panam ke gyo chig, kye pa nyam pa me pa yang, Gong ne gong du pao And I rejoice and delight in all the work you're doing in all the different countries. I saw, I saw Venerable Barbara there too. She works in, 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 in the UK. All you people, Lara, keep doing all the work. All you marvellous people going into prisons, never give up helping others. But the more you work on your own mind, the more qualified you are to help others. If you just do only the compassion wing, as His Holiness says, it's not enough. You'll collapse under it. You could do the wisdom wing that gives iron to your compassion, okay? Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, everybody. So much love, everybody. Thank you, the group in Jorge's house there, a whole group of you. Look at you. Happy to see you all. Okay, people. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much, Diana. And thank you, and thank you, um, everybody. Diana, Francois, Francois Daphne, and Diana. And Siliana. Thank you so much, Diana. Did I speak more slowly? Yes, no, oh, were... Francois says no. Oh, no, Francois. He normally does not simultaneous, so you had to really work hard today. I thought I did. Never mind, I didn't. Next time. Okay. Thank you, Robina. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, sweetheart. Much love, everybody. Next year.